kids out in the industry, and they're able to sell a lot more, and they're able to bring the price down, just like anything. And uh, so now we're seeing them on a bigger horsepower. Seeing them in the air handlers too. All right, so here's our conditions. And do you guys have any glycol in your system? No, no glycol. So, um, have you looked at any um, water or water conditions, flow rates? Uh, no. Just let it ride. Yeah. And what about the cooling and heating temperatures? So you have, you can see here at the bottom of the the input screen, you have entering dry bulb, entering wet bulb for cooling, and of course an entering dry bulb only for heating. And then you have your loop temperatures, entering loop temperatures. So that's what's going into the loop. So, uh, and then you can see the performances, the performance over here. Back here's, you can see the leaving loop temperature on on a previous selection, I have to hit, sorry you can't see the whole screen, I have to hit rate performance there to get that new selection to populate. Hmm. And now over here on this side, we can see the conditions. So you have cooling conditions and heating conditions. Let's just take the cooling conditions first. So <clears throat> total, and this is, um, what we call gross total, not net total. A fan, if it's in um, draw through position, which these are, will add heat, okay? And it's called fan motor heat gain. It's the motor's adding heat. Fan only adds very little heat um, from the friction it's creating, but the, the motor adds heat. And that heat is typically two to four degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, depending on the efficiency. Um, and uh, on these, it's probably very small, less than three. Um, but these numbers is what everyone uses in the industry, and they're all gross numbers. And they do not include the fan motor heat, just something to keep in mind. When you do an air handler, so that's very important, especially big air handlers. You want to know whether your temperatures you're giving somebody or somebody's giving you is out of the unit or off the coil. And depending on whether the fan is blowing through the coil or drawing air um, from the coil, you'll know whether you have to add or subtract heat, that temperature. And it's an iterative process. You won't know until you selected it to, to know how efficient your fan is. And that's determined, that heat is determined by the brake horsepower and the energy equation. So you guys, you guys remember that, right? When we did the, the diagrams, how the fan motor actually pumps that baby up. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so um, again, you've got four, about 43 and a half MBH total, 32 and a half sensible. Now, if we were to change the 8067, which around here with typical minimum outside air, we're looking at about 78.64 on most design build so designs. We, we have a DOAS, which gives us neutral air in the, in the building, okay, on our, on our design, so you can just let it. But you do it good whatever you want. But, uh, but let's, let's see what, what it does. Okay, when right, go to, okay. Let's go to 77, and I'm keep, keep these numbers in your head. 43, 4, 32.5. 32.6. be real accurate. 63, I'm marching the wet bulb down proportionally. It's about one wet bulb to almost two dry bulbs. So let's make it real, real forgiving. What this will do is there's less approach on the coil now, and the unit can't do as much work. It's still the same unit, but you're not giving it as much uh, difference to throw that heat. Uh, if I made it 100 degrees, uh, you would see a much bigger capacity. So now I'll hit rate. And we'll see what happens with the cooling. Didn't like that. 62. So you can see it dropped quite a bit. And that's just because that approach, the temperature of the air coming into the coil and the temperature of the refrigerant in the coil it became smaller, uh, and so you have less uh, 
impetus for that heat to, to go to travel through your exchanger. Going back to 8067. Great. And uh, did you want to leave your um, entering dry bulb and your loop temperature on your heating at 70 and 70? Uh, heating. Probably uh, we're coming down geothermal, right? Yeah, we're going to be less than that. Yeah, so let's see. Make it, uh, I haven't actually ran it yet, so. Let me just put it to 60. Let's put it to 60. Let's put it to 55 and 54. Yeah, we did. We put 55 for dry bulb and, and then. No, 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 no. That's 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 Let me just put 60 in the heating. We're talking about the, what temperature the loop is on the cube. And I'll hit rate. And now we can look at the heating mode or the heating data. And you can see with the entering loop temperature of 60 degrees, and we're pulling heat out of the loop. And the water that's leaving our unit is 52.3 degrees. So at 10.7 GPM, we have a 7.7 .7 degree delta T. So you can take your 10.7 GPM times your 7.7 .7 delta T times 500, and you should come up with that because we're using water, 500 is a coefficient with standard conditions. So um, anyway, that's, that's the selection for you. You can see your leading dry bulb is 100.8 degrees. So the air goes from 70 to 100.8 into the, into the room through the ductwork. And uh, you know, obviously, the room isn't going to be 108 degrees. That's just how much energy in that, uh, that's that basically that's the manifestation of 46 and a half MBH in 1150 degree. 1400 CFM would come out at uh, 100.8. Let's try to bring that down. Can you, can you get me the, do I have to talk to you guys to get the authorization to download and install this thing, this software here? Is this one of the rough ones that you have to? Oh, no, we have an engineer's room. We can get that for you. Because then what we can do is we can just, we can just do that in here and we can play around with it. Right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, then we can, then we can do our selections here. We don't have to have you do a whole bunch of things. Yeah. If you yeah. interact with it in this way. You know. Yeah, let me just talk to McQuay about that, make sure they're good with that. Yeah. And uh, because, you know, they don't want their license, their, uh, their software getting into the wrong hands. So, um, <laughs> but I, I think that would be fine. Do yeah. you want to run any more or you want to stop it there? What do you guys want to do? I, I think that we'll, well, has this confused you all pretty good? Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm so getting there real quick. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Getting there because, real quick. See, what, see what, what always happens with this this refrigeration equipment is that you, you end up kind of trying to calculate your load, okay, which is which we did. And with fan coils and stuff like that, you can kind of pick a fan coil to do almost exactly what you want, okay? That's, that's true. That's okay. the beauty of chilled water. Which is why we did that one first, okay? <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> So then when we, as soon as we transfer over into this refrigeration-driven equipment, all of a sudden everything becomes extremely stock, okay? So now you get an idea of what you want, and then you got to match it to something that these guys make, okay? Because they only do certain things. So, so it's an iterative it's process. Iterative. You need to so We're at an iteration. We'll, and sometimes okay. you'll have to take, <clears throat> hey, I was going to do one unit. You may have to do two. You may have to split it up. Uh, these kinds of things. Can you scroll it back down because it looks like I have a completely different entering and uh, entering and loop fluid, like 40 for heating and 80 for cooling, and that's. Um, so let's let's do that. And remember, we talked about the the limits. Yeah. And for. Water side. On geothermal units, normal is 40, so we're good. Oh. 
So 40, and what was the other condition on the cooling eight. side? What? Eight. 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 eight zero. So they're just telling us that uh, entering water temperature is such a freezing may occur, you may want antifreeze, so glycol. So, in fact, let's <laughs> put the propylene glycol in there. We'll put in 25. So we got to correct our MC delta T, right? Okay. As soon as you did that, yeah, everything gets thrown off. This is right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and this is a good lesson in, you know, our stuff. We don't just pull stuff off the shelf, and we don't just, you know, open a book and point to a number. It's even this, what I would consider very simple equipment, still requires engineering. And then we get into cervical chillers where there's, I don't know, eight, <laughs> eight nine, ten variables to designing a, a centrifugal chiller. Eight, nine, ten degrees of freedom. You may have thousands of options of different uh, chillers you could create, all built or. So I guess the one thing to take away is our job is, is very complex too. Sometimes consultants might lose track of that when they call at 4.30 last night when I was getting, trying to get ready for this and they said I need five air handlers for the new Brain Institute research down there. You're like, gee, should I work on the community college? Well, or work on the <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and, they're, and they're asking for footprint and, uh, and weight. <laughs> Sounds easy, right? You've got to make the whole thing to figure out whether, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't just pop out. So, yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's, and after a while, you get into certain equipment, you get really good at pumping this stuff out. A lot of it, it's like kids doing computer games. Well, how do you do all those things at once? Well, you just get used to doing it. And you don't spend a lot of time on this stuff. The trick is spending just the 10% of your time on 90% of the stuff, and that 10% of the stuff that's critical, super critical, that's where you spend 90% of your time. The trick is knowing what what that ratio is and what stuff you're gonna spend time on. So there's the uh, conditions, I rated that. There's your unit. And that's with the 10.7 GPM and the 1400 CFS. Drop that down. Do you want to do another unit? Or are we running out of time? Uh, well, we got pizza sitting out there. Oh, oh. Yeah. why don't I just show you this VAB box real quick? And, okay. And then you guys can get to your lunch. So, Dave asked that I bring by a VAB box. This is what we call a, a single duct box uh, or a squeeze box. Um, they, they used the word single duct because in the past we did dual duct. It'd be two ducts, a hot and a cold side. Code doesn't allow that. Hey, hey, related to a fan power box, because they got fan power boxes on. Okay. Okay. So uh, this box is similar to a fan powered box in that it has an inlet flow sensor and it has a damper, a modulating air air valve, they call it, or damper. And these are pressure independent boxes. In the past, they didn't have that, and that became a big problem. And, and so they devised sensors that pick up velocity pressure in the front and on the sides, uh, static pressure. And, and these holes are, are placed in such a way that it can average very precisely um, what the uh, associated pressure readings, the difference readings, and through, uh, through formula to figure out what that volume of air would be at any given time. So the controls contractor is monitoring these values. They're hooked up to a transducer that controls manufacturer provides. And he also has a, uh, a microprocessor, a controller. And it usually he's providing a damper actuator all there we mounted in the factory or in the field so they all send their stuff to our factory through some consignment co coordination and it's mounted or they do it in the field um, where this is different from a fan powered box obviously there's no fan 
and there's two types of fan powered boxes there's parallel and there's series flow series flow is where the fan is in line with the primary air that is coming here this is the the cool air that's coming from a central station air handler or a rooftop unit coming in here in a fan powered box there'll be a plenum return and that'll be typically right next to it here and um, that plenum return and the primary air is the fan's source of air okay in a series fan powered box it's always blowing the same amount of air it's constant downstream so if you had a size 0811 with a thousand CFM or well 800 CFM was more in line with that you would always have 800 going out even though this valve may be turning down to only allow 300 CFM in. That means the other 500 is coming through that other opening in the return plenum. Okay? And the other type is a parallel box where the fan is off the side blowing this way and it's only going to be uh, sized for the plenum air and a heating load. So it's a smaller fan and it only comes on for heating and so you'll hear it modulate and it got it was it was much more efficient than a series box but it was noisy. Not in terms of its total noise but in terms of an annoying change in sound. So it kick on. People would hear it. You, you can sit in an office next to a freeway and after a few weeks, you don't even know the freeway's there. It's called white noise. Your, your brain adjusts to it. But you don't like to hear somebody, you know, honk their horn or slam on their brakes. You're going to catch that. Same with a device that comes on and on. So while they were much more efficient, they weren't uh, preferred. And, uh, but they're still around. They're still offered, and they're still used. Uh, series fan-powered boxes have gotten much more efficient because the EC motor we were talking about, um, otherwise, the code would have taken them away and forced everybody to continue with the uh, parallel boxes if they were going to do BAD boxes in the, in the first place. So that's kind of what you got here. Um, and again, the shaft, of course, has to extend through the side of the casing. They call that extended shaft. And uh, these will either come with electric heat or hot water. Uh, they could come with attenuators. But, uh, that's about it. Uh, different linings. This is a a double wall construction. They might come with closed cell or just standard uh, mat based insulation. And there's lots of different options and features you can put on them, but that's about it. Any questions on the single duct box? I can take you guys up and we can kind of relate that thing to what you can see outside. Oh, and kind of tie it up with the heat pump. So the heat pump is a constant volume air. So we call it uh, CVVT, constant volume, varying temperature, uh, much like a fan coil is constant air, and you've got a control valve that's deciding how much water is going to go to that valve, either heating or cooling, to deliver that much energy into the space if it's cold or hot to you know get it back into into temperature based on the loads. Um, this device is changing the volume of air and keeping the water constant, typically. Now, sometimes they'll do both, but it's usually a control nightmare. They usually just turn it on on the water valve. They're opening the valve, and then they're varying the volume of air. So this is variable volume, constant temperature, VVCT. Um, so that's about it. You want to add anything? No, I think it's been very good, actually. Uh, it's, it's pretty good. It's Great stuff. Yeah. So really, thanks for coming. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And I'll get back to you on that software. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, I, I got one. Um, so on, on our on our project that we're working on, uh, some of some of the spaces that we did in our design, we're gonna we're gonna put in the, the water to water to air heat pumps. You know? uh -huh. Okay. Some of them. Uh, they are doing, uh, they did radiant, radiant heat because they didn't want it, they weren't doing cooling in the space for the main coil job. So anyways, what I'm trying to get at <coughs> is uh, kind of like to demonstrate as on the design project uh, the use of uh, 
uh, lower temperature radiation, you know, like, you know how, how it gets so derated, yeah. okay, when, when you start right, running so I, I do all our fin tube, and so very familiar with that. Okay, I can't find any data on, you know, like with regular old, I don't know, are you seeing 120 degree water through regular All the pipe? time. You want to, I'll pull up my uh, computer and I'll show you, i got a little program that <coughs> simulate that, you'll see that it just drops off the map. You, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? We, we were at 180 degrees or whatever with the regular boiler system. But if we take and, and just do a water to water source, uh, heat source on it, it's only going to give us 120 degree water. So it's going to just destroy the capacity of this mm -hmm. stuff. Okay, so so fin, tube, fin tube is, it's pretty, it's really simple. Um, and nobody in the industry spends any time on it, so it always gets screwed up. Right. <laughs> and we figured that out about 12 years ago, just when I came to Norby, decided uh, I was going to handle all of it. And so I do about, probably about a third of the industry's designs, and half of those designs are usually custom stuff. Hmm. And that's the thing that uh, into manufacturers are really good at, is just bending metal. It's just a sophisticated sheet metal shop. And having some empirical data because they're not going to test every one of these applications. For example, when you've got two tiers high, the second tier will do about maybe 40% of the first tier. Hmm. You don't get, uh, it's diminishing returns as you stack tiers. And then you don't want to run water in serpentine. And for example, this program only rates it assuming it's got parallel flows. So when I'm putting in a value, or let's just take a slope top enclosure, wall now. And when I'm putting in the value for flow, one GPM, and I'm doing two tiers, the program is assuming that each tier has one GPM. So if I, if the contractor, and they're going to always want to do this, you got to right? I don't want to You can absolutely do that. Over there, far side. <laughs> Come in here. Okay. It's a pretty drawing. Take yeah, it down. no, it's all right. Take that down. <laughs> it's still there. I draw the concept. <laughs> 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 it's so good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that should be a good marker. That's so, a concept battle. fin tube. So you got two tiers. Here's the ground, right? And there's your, your fins. And a contractor, if you don't tell them, and say you're, you're bringing supply and return to the same side, he's going to come in this side with either top or bottom. He doesn't care. He doesn't know. He's going to put a 90, a little piece here, another 90. He's coming right back through this. You know why? It's cheaper. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so he will not care one way or the other. The engineer will care because he won't get the load that he thought he was going to get out of this thing because our software is simulating one GPM at, in this case, we're talking about 120 degree entering water on both tubes. Now, if he does this, he'll have 120 here. He might have 100 here, right? So this isn't. This isn't 120 anymore, it's 100. So his average water, and he might leave at 90, right? And his average water would be 95. Well, the program's saying, and I'll show you when I enter it, it's assuming I'm entering 110 average water. So loads are off, no one's happy, and no one knows why. <laughs> so <laughs> well, that happens every day. Every in freaking the industry. time. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> the better you get at doing what you're doing here, the more valuable valuable you become to others, and then you don't have to worry about a job ever. <laughs> Absolutely, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> Knowledge is power. So what what should be done here is that the supply should have been fed with a manifold, and you should come back another manifold on a return, okay, go there with a return, like that, or you talk to the engineer, sometimes we're talking to the engineer, they say, you know what, I, I can't afford that, I don't want to do that, or it's not that critical, once you tell them what you got, then you can design it up front, you can say, okay, well, I'm just going to serpentine this, but um, 
you guys may have talked about log mean temperature difference. Okay. <laughs> when a coil uh, sees this, this is approach temperature. So this y-axis is temperature. This would be the water. This would be the air. The air is typically about 60 degrees at the ground or the floor in a design for heating, maybe 65, whatever. This is representing 65. This is, in the old days, it would be 180, right? This is a huge difference. You get a big delta T here. You get lots of energy transmitted from the water to the air. But at the end of the run, so this is the beginning of the fin tube. Is this the fin tube? This is the flow of the water, supply to return. At the end, you get very little flow or uh, heat transfer because the temperature of the water is cold and the temperature of the air is warm. The more uh, optimum way to transfer heat, and you use a log mean temperature di difference, a lot of heat transfer in, I don't know if that was calculus or what, I can't even remember. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, you want to basically take your, your warmest air and your coldest, or sorry, your warmest air and your warmest water to, um, to interface and your coldest water and your coldest air to interface. So you get a nice even uh, delta T across this. So what you get here is you always want to do the um, supply on top and return on the bottom. And that's the way you get the most heat transfer. That's your fin tube. So if you've that's got a serpentine, you want to always do that. And you'll see that in designs. Always do that. Panel